So hello and thank you for joining us in this BBC webinar on intelligent buildings. Um, intelligent or smart buildings is a term that has been banded about for a while and is something that's certainly growing in popularity. So this webinar will take you through what an intelligent building is and how it can benefit benefits landlords, developers and occupiers alike, um, particularly in these strange pandemic times. We are lucky to have an excellent panel with us. We have Stephen Refford from Horley, Nick Wright from CBRE, and Sanjay Ranasang from Wirescore. Stephen and Nick will start with a short presentation each, and then we'll have 10 minutes or so for questions at the end. If you have any questions, please use the Q&A function to ask them, and we'll pick them up at the end. And now I'll hand over to Stephen, who's going to start presenting. Thanks, Kat. All right, so let's just bring this up and start it. So thank you, everybody, for, for, uh, for joining. Um, I'm, I'm really happy that there's so many of you that wanted to attend and come, come listen to us. I think what, when we were looking at what the agenda might be, uh, we kind of agreed that we'll step back slightly rather than just throwing technology at you and actually talk a little bit about the process and the why. Um, I think understanding the, the, this process that we'll build and enables us to make this kind of creative environment, but based on, on a framework and a structured framework. So we can lead you to the, the why with the how. Um, I think it's quite, quite a, a good process to start. So I've got a, a nice little screen here and typically in any industry, there's a whole bunch of jargon. Um, and this is just some of the kind of things that we get out there. There's some sort of um, just information, almost to, to sort of cloud the information, cloud the understanding of it. And, and what I want to do really quite quickly is, is get away from that and start to think about things like this. Um, so so from, from my point of view, quite early on, the ability to stand at the front and based on who, who the, the participants of the audience is, is break it down to really some, some simplistic starting points almost. Um, not about the, the big data or the data lakes or IoT, these conversations, but, but really starting at benefit. You know, what, what's the benefit of this? What are we trying to do? Uh, and that led me quite, quite quickly to try and come up with some definition. Really, what, what's that starting point again? So for me, it's, it's quite straightforward. Uh, an intelligent or smart building, however you want to call it, it, it's two things here. And there's two sentences here that I think really, I can point us in the right direction. One is this enable and automate a more informed decision process by sharing information between systems. Okay. The stuff that we put in, in the buildings nowadays is phenomenal. You know, we put a BMS in and it is fantastic. It's great at being a BMS. We put a lighting system in, we put access, fire, security. All these systems are fantastic. From, from my point of view, the, the intelligent building side of things isn't detracting from that. It, it actually isn't trying to replace any of these things. So, so, for example, from that first sentence, if we start sharing information between those different systems, suddenly we'll find that there's actually more benefit. There's more functionality that can, can drive benefit. There's more, more kind of systems there that, that will really help us. So that's one angle that we always start with, is, is what can we do to share between these different systems? What can we share that will help, you know, help a BMS make better decisions about being a BMS? The second one that, that I've got on there is then focus, I guess, on the users. Let's call them the users. The ability to enhance, and we've got wellness written on there and, and experience for the user. And I'll come on to what that user could be in a minute. But that idea that it's, it, there's seamless operations with, and, and tailored information with a building. In some places, it may be that the user doesn't even know that there's technology behind helping them. One of the big goals here that we want to try and do is, is the user of the building. So not the operations, but the user. That they should be able to focus on what their job is, what their task is ahead, and not on the interactions specifically with the building. You know, I think we've all been into the, the meeting rooms and had the first 10 minutes of trying to sort out cables, trying to get the lighting or the air conditioning right. So, so in some ways, that creates more stress, creates, creates a, a worse wellness environment. Whereas if we can ease that idea, if we can ease the ability of getting into a building, then, then people are focusing more on what they're about and what their job is. And, and therefore, I think the wellness for the user um, improves. So actually they're the two sentences for me that, that, that are really quite important as a starting point. And with those in mind, 
we then get to the technology afterwards. So, so this phrase that I use quite a lot, this is underpinned by technology. The ability that once you've got the idea about what we want to achieve, what, what is that, that, the how and the why, we can then work to a design that then brings out the right technology, the right appropriate technology for that situation. So from my point of view, this is definitely the starting point that we have with, with, with all, of our, all of our clients and all of our conversations. To then get a, I guess a, little, a little bit more detail, we then take that and, and almost break into three, we call them pillars here. Um, and, and when it comes on, there's a, there's a similar approach here. This then starts us to get from this kind of aspirational view into, into more detail about what an intelligent building could do and what it can provide. And this helps unpick the conversation properly. We, we quite often get confused conversations going on where people are looking at it from a different angle. If you're, if you're talking about the building owner or to the building owner compared to the operations guy compared to the guy that's doing benchmarking, they'll all have different either understandings, but equally different requirements. So, so for us, we then take that, those first two sentences and then start to reflect it onto here. So if we look at the first, I guess, pillar column is the user experience. And there, like I say, is if, if, we, if we think about the user as being the user in a building, they've got another task. Actually, what the technology to support them. It may be the interaction, it may be something simple like having an app for them that gets them into the building, this, this very uh, frictionless approach to a building. It may be that they can then make snags if there's problems with the building, but actually it may be just that they can interoperate with the building without actually realizing it and get on with their task. So if they walk into a meeting room and the system knows they are the, the owner of that meeting, maybe things start to happen automatically in the background. So maybe they don't even know they're interacting. And, and so I think that experience, that enhanced experience for a user is definitely one vertical that, that we look at, quite separate from the other two. The second one we have there then is the operational, call it efficiency. And that, that's about looking after the building, keeping that building running, keeping that building working, being efficient with that. It could be the energy efficiency of how things operate, this interaction between systems to make it more efficient. It, it, could, be the, um, it could be the actual the manpower efficiencies that we do things that make things more efficient. It could be that we're getting away from planned maintenance and we're using dynamic maintenance because we've got this information. So that's an operational efficiency, which is quite different from the user experience that we want to get out of this. But actually, when we go further down the line and see that the technology that we deliver is probably the same thing, but it just serves these different groups in a different way. The third one we've got on there then is the, is the business side of things. So the, the business enterprise, we call it, or the management side of things. And this, this is probably the, the least used at the moment, it's, it's spoken about a lot, but I think that's the idea about getting data out of, out of the system, about using information. It could be about the, the occupancy density, big topic at the moment. It could be about benchmarking between the buildings. It could be about the supply chain, for example. When we talk to some of the large public organizations, there's a large area where we can really help with information by sharing what used to be just in the plant form has now moved out into the workspace. Actually, that third step is now working out into the rest of the building, rest of the, the business building, as it were. So these kind of three groups, the reason for showing this again is we start with the two sentences and then start to look at what a building can, can provide or what it needs to provide with these kind of lenses of, of approach. For us, what we then do, again, as I said before, this kind of underpinned by technology, we start to lead the, the conversations through workshops, through, through, through designs, through understanding, through thought pieces, for example, um, of taking those three pillars and actually trying to build out these user experiences. Uh, and for, for a project, this could be five, 10, it could be 100 user experiences. And these are the journeys, you say, the user journeys, based on what that kind of user of the building is. Um, with this, we then work out what experience we're trying to give to them. And from there, we then work out what the technology input needs to be. Where does it touch on technology? What are we trying to achieve with the technology? And as we then run through a project, that gives us almost an audit trail. So we can work back to why we're doing certain things from the technology side. It brings us back to all well, these are the aspirations that we're trying to, to achieve. So this one you'll see is, is uh, based on uh, museums or public spaces about what we can do to to increase that interaction with the building, even if they may not really know it. 
And then the second page that I'll show you is kind of the, the, the same place, but actually it's from the view of the, the operations. So that same building has got a different view if you look at it from the operations, what they need to get out of it. Um, and again, the reason that we want to go through this is to help understand this is the, the, the flow, the process to work out what that technology is. Because otherwise, we start with technology, there is almost no wrong technology, but it may not be appropriate for what it is we're trying to achieve. So getting more relative, I would say at this point, is this return to work. So, so, so the idea, and it's probably slightly, um, slightly stalled again at the moment with, with the latest news, but actually the, the idea of the, the, what building intelligence or the intelligent building side of things can, can bring to a return to work. Well, actually what we found recently is that the majority of what we've been designing previously is actually been accelerated by this. It's not a particularly good situation. But actually what it has done is, is meant that we can we can kind of push things before that we were trying to get to. Certainly under the idea of this peace of mind, the, the idea that for staff coming into a building, actually if we look at it from their point of view, this peace of mind is, is probably one of the most important things to look at. That they feel comfortable arriving at the building, um, that they feel comfortable getting to wherever it is they work, uh, and that there's information around for them specifically. So here, for example, we talk about a frictionless interaction for the user. And that's the idea that, that actually we no longer need fobs or cards to get into the building. We should be using things like the phone. Maybe not facial recognition at this point, but certain things like the phone. And actually then that's under this current situation, that, that's a better solution. It, it means that they don't have to interact. From an environmental point of view, it means there's no plastic anymore. We're not using fobs. So this all helps this kind of return to work for, for the user point of view. The second bit on those pillars, if we think about it, the operations, there's a lot more about the environmental sensing. We're talking about air quality, we're talking about noise and light levels, this kind of environmental information. And the technology behind it is so mature now and the cost of deployment is so good that actually this is a really straightforward way to, to even on a refit level and a new build. So the idea of doing environmental sensing for operations means they get more information about what's going on. Is it about airflow that we've now got to actually look at in a slightly different way? Is it about outside air is it about ensuring that uh, the air quality is, um, is at the level that it should be or in fact that a desk has been used that we've got this occupancy information um, for the management and therefore we need to make sure that the cleaning is appropriate you know things that we've done before where we've talked about a meeting room and we're only ever booking it for two people and actually we should reallocate it because we get more people in there we're almost reversing it now that if we've got this occupancy density if we understand but actually we know that we're getting too many people in these areas at the moment from a safety point of view. Uh, the intelligent building side of things also brings in the ability, let's say that uh, a meeting room or an area was not meant to be used at this point. We're all seeing offices layout where we're using a 10th or, or 20% of, of the area. But actually if we then find that somebody has gone into an area that, that wasn't meant to be, if we've got systems that can recognize that, we can then instigate certain actions behind. Maybe the cleaners have to come in again and, and make sure that that area is safe for it to be reused. So this kind of page, um, and there's a flyer there that I think we'll probably send out afterwards, is that, that idea that these things for this return to work are, are pretty much the same things from, from the intelligence, but we've got this, this focus of this peace of mind and this information as you see on there. I'm just aware of the time that I'm on. Um, what I did want to get onto there as well, just one, one small bit, this is kind of this immediate trends, the things that we're seeing at the moment that are also driving the topic of intelligent buildings. Uh, the speed of adaption, as I said before, things like the IT guys, the ability that they've got at the moment to, to I guess, support these ideas, things that were, were difficult before, that we had an idea, but actually the deployment and implementation was quite hard because of the speed of adaption that's now getting a lot easier or a lot smoother. People understanding we need to do these things quicker. And, and that helps, that helps drive this. The middle one there is this task-based attendance. And this time it's kind of bubbling and uh, I'm trying to work out, I guess we're trying to see if it's, if it's being driven by the, uh, the building owners or actually by the tenants or by the staff. But this idea that we're no longer really looking at being desk-based, we're actually maybe looking at going in to do a specific task. Uh, either way, what we're finding is, is definitely a simplified booking of that. It, it's, it's really straightforward. It's nothing 
complex it is the ability that for people to be able to say yep i'm coming in the office today and and, and I, I can come in and therefore in the background the operations know that they've got the right kind of quantity that they're not going to be overloaded with the density and then the third one i think there that again we're kind of seeing bubbling up is this idea this nomad, nomadic workforce but this hub and spoke as a phrase not quite sure exactly where it's going to going to land but certainly what it brings is, is this idea for the, the, the peace of mind for the staff. And if they're going to be going into different locations and different places, and we want them again from peace of mind is to focus on, on, on their task and not actually on the, the, the problem of getting in the building. They should have a, a, an ability to get in, into whatever building it is. So their access process, whether it be the, the phone, hopefully, just means that they can get in quite easily. So that nomadic workforce is definitely a, a trend that, that we're seeing um, on, this, on this immediate return to work. And then for me, I guess, I guess it's pushing a little bit is, is the, the future where it goes um, after this return to work, hopefully we get back. The, the data, the data is something I guess started a few years ago, the idea of talking about data and everyone's trying to get as much information out of a building as possible, but didn't really know what to do with it. Um, products weren't really mature enough, analytics were okay. But I, I really do think now we're at a place where we understand this a lot better and actually therefore understand what we want out of it and what we want to do with that. And so I think that the data side is, is definitely growing for, for us and feeding that as a benefit back into the whole design cycle as well as the operational. And the second one there I think is the precinct, you know, the community, the city. This is an area now that we're, we're I think we're, we're doing really well on what we can provide for a building and even an approach to a building for users, the, the, the process for operating a building. We, we should be looking now further and actually connecting those buildings together, starting to build communities. Um, and that's also on the back of this kind of hub and spoke that maybe smaller community areas are going to start. And we kind of need to do things to support that. So the, the last bit I've got on there is, is I kind of started in this in, in the 80s, writing integrations, and it really was quite exciting trying to get that stuff. But I really do feel at the moment we're, we're at this point where maturity of technologies is just just fantastic the, the, the costing of it the ability to deploy that means that we've got these ideas where we want to go with it it's it's, it's just it's possible it's feasible um, and so i think the next few years hopefully we get past the COVID, will be quite fantastic so thank you for listening to me that, that's it for me i will stop and um, hand over to nick thanks stephen that was brilliant um, my apologies in advance, Stephen and I have been collaborating and we're fairly much on the same page with regards to this, which either means we're the outliers on the top of the mountain screaming, or this is genuinely the direction of travel for um, smart buildings and intelligent buildings. Let me just quickly bring up my few slides. So um, thanks very much for having me today. Uh, my name is Nick Wright. I'm work for CBRE and I head our digital sales team. So one of my um, responsibilities is leading our smart buildings, intelligent buildings team. And what we try and do is help clients to shape the business case for investing in technologies in their buildings. And today, similar to how Stevens approached this, what we really want to do is sort of slightly debunk the myth of smart buildings. I think my biggest frustration is when clients say, I want the smartest building, and there's a disconnect between what that means and what reality actually is. So I want to take you through some of the processes we're looking at. There are some similarities um, with Stephen's slides, but I think it will help you understand a little bit more about kind of what we're seeing in the market. And try and think not about technology, try and think about output, try and think about what the plans and strategies are from your real estate client, be that an investor or an occupier, and think of technology as the enabler. It's the part that makes that plan happen. So where do we sit? Well, we, we've, we've focused very much around understanding those connections between the PhD of buildings. So the physical, the building side of, of this dynamic, the human being the organization and the people, and it's the connective tissue and the enablement, the glue, that digital provides. Ultimately, we have a similar approach around four key pillars. So we believe that smart buildings help, help drive greater operational efficiency, help meet sustainability targets, specifically around net zero, drive greater productivity on the humans and the people side, 
and improve the experience of the individuals using those spaces. And I think that's the important bit. It's, it's recognizing that that digital part plays a role between the building and the people, the physical and the human. Clearly, we've seen an acceleration due to COVID around demand for technology. We've seen that most from our occupier clients. And um, I wrote my script at the beginning of the week, so it's slightly out of date already when I say that clients are wrestling with how they get their people back into the office. I think that's still the case and that hasn't gone away. But what we're finding is that there is a definite focus around technologies today which will help deliver that. Whether that is helping to minimize the spread of the virus, whether that is helping to understand more about air quality, but more importantly around desk booking, room booking, people flow, really getting to the nub of an understanding data and the analytics that flow from that, which define space utilization. And you can see from here that what we're finding across our client base is that there is a drive and a rise in um, technology investment from our occupier base, 88% intending to increase that. And of that, 63% looking at how can they deploy technology to improve the workplace experience. What's interesting is we're also finding that that decision around taking space from a corporate real estate director in a corporate business is changing. The stakeholders are growing. We're finding that um, more uh, stakeholders from the HR function, from operations, are beginning to have a say in that decision. And it's important that you picture that because the use of digital and technology is all about the brand. It's all about how you get your people to have a different frictionless experience in that environment. And we think that real estate is being squeezed by two parts. One is socially responsible investment that's pushing downwards from the investment cycle and is very much affecting the sustainability, the ESG ratings of buildings. And therefore your investors and landlords are having to make decisions about how do we meet those targets. And from the other side, we're finding that the drive for um, attraction, retention of talent, the war for talent, and, and having a building as a representation of core values. Real estate's in the middle of this being squeezed. And we think that the, the, the use of digital in that enablement function very much allows organizations to begin to capture large quantities of data. With that, you can begin to analyze, you can identify issues, you can fix, improve, and ultimately move into monitoring and reporting on a regular basis. Essentially, that technology is a enabler and an underpin will help protect and improve overall value and performance. So we talked about four pillars. These are our four pillars looking at the top half, that building side, the physical, the bottom half about the organization and the people. What if you have to rank these, how do you begin to rank them in order of preference to then start to understand what your journey is how you're going to find the key drivers behind your strategy, and then what those solutions are from a digital perspective, and what are the right technologies that you're going to deploy. So it's a process of uncovering what those needs and drivers are. We also look at this across an ambition scale. So it's all very well understanding these drivers, but how ambitious is the client in the first instance? If you think about buildings today, they're mostly automated. They're beginning to become more connected. The drive is towards smart, but then ultimately in the next few years, we're gonna start seeing predictive buildings and further out from that, cognitive buildings. So when we're working with clients to help them plan their digital strategy, we want them to think about what that future looks like. The challenge, however, is finding decent return on investment data that shows that these kind of investments are worthwhile. So our recommendation is that setting those drivers is absolutely key. What are those steps around it? Think about what those drivers are, why you need that technology, and then work out your vision, your use cases, a dive into the specific technologies, and then work around that selection and evaluation. I think the exciting time we're in today is where clients are moving their digital strategy from a nice to have pre-COVID where it was under consideration into a must have. 
And those use cases around air quality, desks, desk booking, space monitoring, the ability to start looking at predictive cleaning is the most exciting part about a starting point. We want clients to start small, but understand that they can have a platform that they can build on over time as they become more comfortable with the technologies and as they become more comfortable with the analysis and how that is changing their decision making. The best, or sorry, I think the future of offices at the moment is on an upward trend with digital that's going to underpin it. And when I say that, what I'm excited about is that traditionally real estate has looked at a moment in time. And that moment in time is a past moment where we see the real advantage and what's going to deliver a completely different outcome is a shift in mindset around moving from that moment in time into real time information and how that will affect decision making. Traditionally, you clients have said, well, I have a problem. They've got a team around it. That team's gone away and collected data. They've produced a report and that report has then been actioned. The reality is that might have taken weeks or months to get to. In that time, the issue that they're trying to address could have got worse, could have cost more, could have had a different outcome. Whereas now we're shifting into an era of real time information. So my advice, get comfortable with digital and technology, start small, understand the needs and drivers that can be driven through that. And like Stephen, think about those personas and journeys from individuals. How do they connect with the, with the, with the built environment and how do they actually integrate that technology into delivering outcomes? Start small, have a plan that allows you to grow over time and begin to get comfortable with large quantities of data, the analytics you can drive from that, and most importantly, how real-time information will begin to change decision-making in real estate. So thank you for listening. I'm going to stop sharing now and we'll go back to the screen. Well, thank you very much, Nick and Stephen. They were both very insightful uh, presentations. I'm going to kick off the questions then with one for Sanjay, who um, is also here on the panel. Um, so we're aware that WiredScore are currently developing their smart building certification. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, um, thanks, Catherine. And I think it really reflects what Nick and Stephen have really been talking about, is the fact that we've transitioned from a place where smart buildings is about technology um, to the outcomes. And it's, it's become solidified and matured, like repeating words that have been said here, that we've built together a group of leading landlords around the world. But from the UK, we have the likes of... Um, British Land, LNG, Derwin, GPE, who have come together and discussed with us what it means, what SMART means to them, what their thoughts are. And we've, we've really honed this down to it being outcome-based. And I think that's a, a real step change in the market, that where the landlords and developers are now considering outcomes of delivery of SMART, it really allows for that true integration with the work that Nick and Stephen are doing, like implementing user stories. Um, what's, been, what's been key from our gathering from, uh, from our smart council really is that getting towards that unified definition of smart. Um, people have different drivers and levers they're looking for smart across the landlord community, but actually with a, a unified thread of going through to like, how do we act to trends like the return to work all the way to really, how do we uh, derive benefits for all the users of the buildings? I really like Nick's word around audience, the different audiences you have to deal with in the building. And I think, I think we've learned, um, through engaging with our council members, that there is a there's a space now that you can start to rate buildings. You see the work, the design effort that Stephen is going into, like implementing those user journeys in buildings, and how Nick is promoting that. If we actually take that and take a step back, the industry is now in a position where we can compare how well landlords and developers are taking that on and taking that into their own stride. And we really see a space for that. And, and thus, as, as you mentioned at the beginning, we're pushing towards the launch of a smart building certification that's driven by user experience and outcomes, underpinned by the digital technology that delivers it. And that will sit alongside what we're doing with our digital connectivity certification. Do you have any idea of timings for that? Uh, yeah, so we're having a really active engagement, not only with our, our council right now, uh, but also we have a group of technical advisors, which I'm 
pleased to say Nick and Stephen, fortunately, are also members of, um, and we're pushing through our product development uh, in this quarter, and, and we're targeting a launch in, in early 2021. Uh, it's really exciting to have our, our council members um, with us through that, through that process, and it's going to be an exciting time uh, early next year. Brilliant, thank you. Um, there's no other questions popped up yet, so... Uh... <laughs> You obviously done such a good job covering everything. <laughs> um, I had one for you, Stephen, actually. Um, you spoke about the speed of ad adaptation. How do you keep your buildings current? Well, I, th that's a great one. So one of the things that we, we, we start to talk about when we get into some of the details is kind of like the refit or the fit out, um, the cycle, where, where historically that would be, for example, like every 15 years you'd almost have that hope. And within that, everything will get changed. You know, what we can find now is we've already got much smaller iterative increases, and that could be functionality. You know, a lot of this stuff we're doing is the hardware is pretty solid, it's pretty stable, but actually it's the software layers are bringing that out. So there's a lot of that. There's, there's two angles. That then keeps it current, keeps it the, the new functionality. Um, behind it is obviously the idea of this sort of uh, the BIM or the digital twin or the ability to have uh, data uh, standard naming conventions, way to, to make sure that if we change stuff out, it doesn't stop the whole thing working. So I think it's that kind of combination, if that answers your question. Yeah. Um, Nick, one for you. What are the barriers to digitizing? That's a great question. I think what we're finding is that there are probably, the biggest challenge is the, the level of knowledge and understanding around what smart and intelligent digital twin buildings are. And therefore, clients come into the market and say, I want one of those. There's a challenge then in under, unpicking that to actually identify what it is they want and why. There's also a little bit of a herd mentality in real estate where most people will go, oh, I want, not, I want one of those because I've seen it in the market and it works. That isn't necessarily the right answer because buildings are all different, have different strategies behind them and have different outcomes behind them. So again, not following the herd is really important. And I think the third part, which again, we've, we've wrestled with and actually the group of people on this call are really important for, you know, with Sanj with his um, building, the smart building certification, Stephen with what he's done and, and some of the work with I'm doing as well is around What's the ROI? How do we build that business case that says, if you deploy this, you will see a 20% improvement on operational efficiency or a 5% reduction in utilities. There's not enough granular data out there at the moment because there just simply aren't enough smart buildings that have been operational for long enough. So I think the industry needs to think about how we collect that kind of information because that's an informative part of all of us progressing through education, through implementation of technology. So I think those three things, the, the, the lack of understanding, the herd mentality, and the building of the ROI and the data that supports. Okay, we've got a few more now, some in the chat and some in the Q&A. So I think the first one in was from Benjamin Lesser. Um, for traditional landlords, how do the panel expect resourcing requirements to change over the next five years with such a drive towards new technology happening? Happy to start. Yeah. I, I think the resourcing piece is really interesting. Um, we have a, a, a big global FM business. And if you think about those outcomes and the output, I think that where we're going to get to is potentially a headcount reduction around the operation of buildings and the management of buildings, but it's going to improve the efficiency of it. I don't think we're going to see wholesale getting rid of people, but it's going to change the way individuals on the ground deliver that data and analytics and react to how the building is, is communicating and what needs to be done. So the days of wandering around with a clipboard and checking every light once a month are gone. The potential is that you will be informed of something that is either about to break or has broken, and it will help improve that time. So there will be resourcing that may reduce, but the efficiency of that's going to increase. I think one thing I'd add to that as well is um, you can deliver a great experience in the building with great people. Uh, and that's you know, one, one of the aspects that people approach, like delivering traditional um, great 
experience in those buildings, but it's just not scalable. And I think, I think this is the notion of underpinning it by technology. So removing the lower value tasks that people are doing in operating the building to make sure those people that you have in the building are delivering that sort of best in class experience paired with technology, not necessarily replaced by technology. Yeah. Okay, okay another one um, from Derek Clement. Um, how do you envisage the use of wearables in monitoring health in the workplace? Uh, I'll jump on that one quite. So I think we've got both. I think the, the idea we've been involved in a number of sort of uh, the, the smart health, smart hospitals, but even in the, the office side, I think the, the idea of wearables was definitely on the horizon. I think some of the latest technologies we're seeing, actually, it doesn't even need to be a wearable that there's sensors within that space that can work out if you're breathless, it could recognize you by your vital statistics almost, um, and therefore can understand if you need assistance, if you're stumbling, um, heart rates and things like that. So I think it's, it may be a little bit too early. It's a little bit like facial recognition, right? That we're kind of going, well, actually it could be really useful, but there's still this reluctance. Um, we've got to give this perceived equity. People have got to get something out of it. So, the health side of things, I think, is, is, is definitely a massive positive, isn't it? It could be seen very much as a positive. Um, so it may not be terrible so much as sensing you, I think would be my, my takeaway. Hi, Derek, by the way. I think it's a really good question because it raises another point, which is who's driving change? And I think if you think about it from a consumer perspective, so the individuals who occupy the space and work there on a day-to-day -day basis, what we're finding is that actually our homes are probably smarter than our offices. We've got voice activated equipment. We've got Alexa. We've got um, energy monitors in the, in the kitchen that tell you when the light's gone on and off. And actually what we're not doing is using those technologies in that transition back into the office. I'm in the office today and I'm, I'm walking around a relatively open, built, open space. And what horrifies me is that we have phones on every single desk. And yet for the last six months, everyone's been using mobile and they continue to use mobile in the office. So when are we going to wake up and transition to what we have in the home into what we have in the office? I'm on a campaign to get rid of phones on desks. It's not going to happen, but I think it's really important. And it's a cost saving we could make immediately because we're all comfortable with that connectivity and using our phones. So that wearable piece is really important. We're comfortable with them in our day-to-day -day life. How do we integrate those with potentially um, better healthy eating, more activity? You know, we're not allowed to go in the lifts anymore, so let's plug into, the, into our wearables and use the stairs and gamify it. Who's the mm -hmm. most active in the building? Great point. Um, a question from Andrew Moore. Have you examples of where investment in smart pays off for example um number of years paid off for existing portfolios not just new buildings yeah i think a, a general is, is yes i think if we look at the the operational side of the, talk about the pillars again i think the, the idea of proving a, a, an roi on uh, on operation definitely there's figures i think there's figures on uplift of rentability so the, the ability to, to charge more for a place because of this is there an area that we're still i guess not struggling with but we're trying to get more formed more focus is is the wellness of the, the staff and the well-being of the staff the, the effect of what we do to increase their wellness and obviously the work output from that side of things um but yeah we're definitely getting into that space and that for us obviously i think for all of us makes it an easier discussion, especially from the financial side of things. So, well, here's an investment and here's what you're going to get back from it. And, and we're, we, we've had these conversations separately offline. Um, that's where we're trying to get to because it, it gives a relativity, it gives a scale to everything. I'd, I'd agree. And I'd also say it's not clear cut yet. We're using evidence around, you know, are buildings leasing faster because of the technology in there? Are they going to the occupiers who are thinking most forward thinking um, are we seeing changes in the general market pattern and the value of buildings suspect that with the new product coming to the market that what we're going to see more of is a case of not necessarily premiums around digital buildings mm -hmm. but those that aren't matching the new products you're going to see decreases in value yeah. and the mm -hmm. final point i make is that we've been working on how do you evidence productivity? 
and we've got a couple of clients who we're working with in the Netherlands and now in the UK where we've been doing very in-depth sentiment surveys but also allowing greater access to the well-being elements of you know light biophilia better food exercise time away and that is evidencing productivity and those can be underpinned by technology so if we can get that right and we can look at the value and we can look at leasing those are all metrics that go along with Stephen's metrics around the operational efficiency that we can start to actually evidence the return. And I think I think it's that, to. yeah that that journey as well that we have with solid data around operational efficiency and energy saving, which is very much on the, the the landlord side, and now slowly moving it into like the tenant the tenant area for ROI, and that then drives the rents. So ESG that we talked about already, I think, is a key area because the office spaces are a big user of all, the biggest user of energy for for most corporate occupiers. And and then I think as as Nick said, it's that same thing. It's, it's the obsolescence prevention is going to become the new angle of ROI on smarts. Yeah. And and it's it's a big journey like to get into productivity and wellness, but we can see that we've had this shift this year, and that the return to work that Stephen's talking about is is showing a building that can be adaptable and quickly respond will get people back into it and is driving value immediately. And the comparison is probably digital buildings is where sustainability was twelve years ago. You know, everyone was designing, beginning to design for Brio Excellent, but nobody really thought it was worthwhile. It was just a, a nice to have. And we're now at a point where it's absolutely critical. It's not going to take us 12 years to get to this point with digital buildings. That's going to happen a lot faster. Yeah, great. Absolutely great. Okay, one last question then um, from Andrew Hardwick. To what extent do you think mobiles will be the next global health hazard? Anyone? I, I don't mind jump. I don't mind starting with this one because I was, I, I was going to make a comment when Nick was sort of saying um, about getting rid of desk phones. Um, it's, it's a bit counterintuitive actually, but actually um, buildings often have awful mobile reception, and when you have bad reception, you're actually exposing yourself to more um, RF. So almost it's, it's we want buildings to actually be able to encompass and incorporate those technologies proactively. And not only does it give you that better quality of service, say for mobile, but it also does actually mean that systems are working at their optimal rather than trying to be like over gamed, which will lead you to these potential issues where such a such things, such hazards could be raised. It is quite tied in a lot of this stuff still, isn't it? To the mobile, to to it's that kind of point of everything. We've got the wayfinding, we've got all this kind of interoperation from it. And uh, I wonder if we'll get away from that. More gesture control on panels rather than actually touch panels, something like that. You know, the, the, we can be aware of people, who they are, without it being based on their phone. Um, yeah, I'd like to see more of that and less of it, the phone for that reason. But uh, try getting the phone away from people. It, it's, that's maybe a tough one. Definitely. Okay, well, there's, there's quite a lot of chat about phones and their health. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's probably a good time to wrap it up unless anybody's got any final words of wisdom. No, not from my side of me. I just, just lovely being on the panel with the other two, uh, me as well. Yeah, just really good. I, I think these are conversations it's nice to have and we should be having more of them and more open conversations. Yeah. And agree with Stephen, you know, we're passionate about this change and, and um, you know, where we are today is seeing an acceleration of that and I think everyone needs to understand the direction of travel really. Yeah. And do you think the market's coming to like a, a solidification of what that, that direction is and it's, um, it's going to be really exciting to watch how uh, the next couple of years come through as people change that sort of outcome focus. Yeah. Brilliant. Well, thank you all. That was a, a great webinar, I hope, for everyone. Um, and thanks, everyone, for joining us. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for coming. Bye.